we still have a, a lot of things to talk about, especially around developer expectations, because we've been hearing a lot about about ops, a lot about ops, a lot about ops. Not a whole lot about what is really what does the developer expect other than to make it easy. You know, what are platform services? You talk about abstractions, and we're talking about operations all the way up to you know different kinds of services. So what might those be? What does the developer want? Not yeah, he wants to deploy easy. You know, I love. Node.js and NPM, because I can just grab something, install it, done. I don't have to worry about it. It's taken care of. It's nice. But there's still other services. What, what, are, what services do I want? What needs to be offered? When you're building a, a pass or you're going to make an offering, what kind of services need to be you know, offered? I mean, is Amazon a pass? Does anybody agree with that statement? One person does. Other people are, eh, yeah. They have some services, right, that are very developer-oriented. but you know, are, are they really what developers want from a pass? What, what do developers want? It's kind of like that, what women want. We're going to find out what developers oh. want. You knew we had to go there. You knew it. You I'm going to let the you. panel introduce themselves now so I don't say something else that gets me in trouble. And then we'll get started with well, some could questions. Be Mel <laughs> I'm not Helen Hunt. Is go, ahead. Starting? go ahead, Adrian. So you start. Cool. I'm Adrian Hall. I uh, work for Basho. We build a distributed database called React. Um, in the past, I've also worked a lot with this thing called Cloud Foundry and Pass. So I have a lot of experience with that. Awesome. Uh, my name is Dr. Nick Williams. I am Australian. Enough <laughs> 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 said. Uh, I was at uh, Engine Yard for two years. Now uh, run a consultant called Stark & Wayne, which is uh, the only consultancy probably business in the world ever that has two, not one, but two fictional founders. Uh, so it's good to have Tony Stark and uh, Bruce Wayne on board. Um, that was a meeting of the minds. Uh, now mostly focusing on Cloud Foundry because, uh, well, hopefully you've heard one or two things about why. All right. I'm Richard Sirother. I'm a Microsoft MVP and InfoQ editor about cloud computing and also a product manager for Tier 3. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, Pradeep Prabhu. Uh, co-founder and CEO of Cloud Munch. Uh, our focus is to let developers uh, focus on code and uh, uh, let, uh, you know, test the code, deploy it, integrate it, and deploy it to any cloud or any pass. Awesome. So we've got a lot of different kind of ideas about pass and services. And this was really interesting, what you just said, test. That's something I don't hear often when you're talking about platform services. Testing is an integral part of development, right? You want to test often, test early, right? You do that over and over. Is, is that a, a service that needs to be offered? Is that something that's part of PASS? Is that what developers expect? What, what is it that they need? I think if, I'm going to go first. <laughs> <laughs> OK, go ahead, Nick. You know, um, I definitely think so. I, I, if the, whatever we want our developers to do, if you think of it from a managed perspective and a, a business's best interest perspective, um, whatever we want them to do, we should make as easy and as intuitive as possible. The easier it is to do, the, the more likely they'll do it. And we want them to test. If we make it easy for the test to be run, if we make it fast for the test to be run. And if, there's, if you think of one thing you want to scale up and down really quickly, it's running a fleet of tests and then throwing all that computation away. Um, God, if, uh, we, where, where, where I work at the moment, uh, you know, we're constantly working on the, the test harness around Cloud Foundry. So we use test, you know, Cloud Foundry underneath it, but it's, you know, the automation of tests is one of the major bits of work we have to do. Would love not to have to do it. We'd just want to be able to drop in whatever app we're working on and get going straight away with the, you know, make sure the tests are running. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, if the pass doesn't have that, then it needs to get built. Um, if the pass does have that as a capability, excellent. Um, it's an extra benefit. And also, just along with the things that you would assume you have with tests, you know, the ability to roll back to the previous version. You know, if you put something out there and it breaks, you don't want it to actually be deployed. Um, that's something that's pretty pivotal that I know some passes have built in and some don't. Um, but the possibility is always there to add it. Yeah, so protecting it's a production thing. is a pretty important characteristic. Yeah. For most people, I think. Have you seen much of that, though? I mean, I was running through some of the passes in my head, like Force, where you kind of have to do a developer sandbox by yourself, and you push it later, or Azure, again, you kind of stage Is that what we're talking about? We're not talking about what we have now. We're talking about what we want. True, what but we want I, I got to go home and work <laughs> on something. So, I mean, it is what we, we want tests, now. all right? Yeah. And some, some passes do have it, and some yeah. don't. Do you like, see much uh, of it? 
uh, App Harbor has it built in for .NET. CloudBees has it built in for Java, so you can always roll back to the previous one. Node Jitsu has it for Node.js. Um, and you know, this is just a conglomeration of open source software in a lot of those cases. Uh, you know, they use like Jenkins or some existing CI, yeah. Yeah. and then if it succeeds, that goes to production. If it doesn't, it rolls back. Yeah, so. making, making the, the, the thinking about continuous deployment as, as easy for an organization as possible. Because a lot of this is new. Not, not many of us have been classically trained in continuous deployment. Because that's not classical, that's new. No, right. but we've been tested in you know, configuration management and you store it here and you run your builds and you deploy out. I mean, you know, I was doing that way back when and I will not date myself by saying when, but you know, that's how we built software, right? You check it in, you worry about versioning, you deal with it, you build it, it's broke. You, know, you go through that process before you deploy. Now that's something you don't hear a lot uh, talked about with pass or, or you know, just any of the, the cloud stuff in general is, you know, how are we going to integrate those kinds of services that developers need to make it easy? Because that is a pain in the, you know, exactly. I mean, it's not fun. How do you make that easier? Is that, is that something we need to address as some of those more developer-oriented management problems that they're dealing with that suck up a lot of their time? You know, trying to figure out where the build script failed. How do I check this back out? Which version am I on? One of, one of the things I think yep. has affected Pass a lot in that regard too is the culture in which kind of led the way with Pass. Um, some of the culture that originated it, like around, say, Heroku, for instance, a lot of that culture already did testing and already did early, early testing with TDD and things like that just by the, the way that things were done with Ruby on Rails. As it's been spread out to more languages and things, it's not always been part of the native culture to do test first or to do TDD or whatever. Um, and it's been something that needs to be kind of plugged in as an afterthought. And it does need to be added as a service. It needs to be added as an additional offering or platform on top of the platform or whatever. So at this point, I would definitely say past technology has reached a point where it needs to be added as an offering, not just assumed as part of the culture or the development yeah. practices of a company. Yeah, and also what uh, I've seen from users and developers is that uh, the developer expectations change based on the kind of app they're building, the kind of scenarios they're working with, and the kind of team sizes. So if it's two or three developers working together, I mean, they may not care too much about uh, testing and you know, the simple code, and they just want to push directly onto a pass, Heroku, Cloud Foundry, whatever it is. But as the applications get a little bit more complex, and uh, there's legacy code, and Adron's point about rolling back becomes very real, <laughs> you know, many of the times. That's when they want to see a software delivery deployment pipeline, right? So the developer expectations range from rock star developers uh, building few small code and, or larger code to legacy development teams trying to manage this whole transition of that app and new features onto the cloud. So this is where the complexity of pass and integration with dev tools, all of that come in. You're also probably seeing some of these with actually giving you a local fabric. I mean, Engine Yard, I think, has something you can run locally. Cloud Foundry, Micro, I can run tests locally. Azure's got a fabric. So even if you are just doing local testing to see how cloud feels before pushing it up to a public pass, I mean, at least that tooling helps to try to get a sense of not writing things to disk or treating things as a foundation set of services, not as you know, VM or machine affinity. I mean, if you want to talk about what services we, developers want, we want everything that's from the origination of code through to the next 60 months worth of the app living, mm -hmm. the whole life cycle. Um, and so, you know, if it's local, you know, we want the thing to be reproducible locally for local development. We want it, you know, obviously in production. Sure. Where, where I work, we have, I mean, code goes through perhaps what you might have referred to as an older style. You know, there's an integration testing platform. We have Cloud Foundry running for that. We have Cloud Foundry, another one for running for for, for reliability testing, another one for staging, another one for production. Um, and we need services on top of that mm. to move stuff through. And then we need services to understand what's running, the code itself running. Because when I say classical training, you may have learned that stuff eventually. But there's still a mental focus that most developers have, which is on the code itself. So I like Ruby uh, as a language. And one of the things Ruby people like it, and we, we, I know this because we talk about it all the time. It's how beautiful it is, and how expressive, and how much I, you know, happy it makes me. I'll tell you what makes code less happy is when you actually put it in production. Um, <laughs> and, and 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 that's where I think it passes. You know, provide if we want to say it's responsible for something, 
it's allowing us to actually feel like we actually can run a production system without necessarily having to go on you know, 24 by 7 support and you know, feel like we have to join an ops team. We can sort of be responsible for production. Yeah, and one of, one of the other big challenges what developers face is, you know, it works for me, but it doesn't work for you. I mean, and, that, and, that, and the reason is because the pass environment or the cloud environment and the dev environment are, are not exactly identical. Mm -hmm. And there's no way to replicate it because they are different parts that are offered by maybe different teams or different companies. And it's not. So dev, test, and running in the cloud is disjointed. And that's not, that's not good for anybody. And that's, that's one of the challenges we have to the other, other point that pass should have other things for like continuous integration, testing, all integrated and connected if you really want to make the reality of dev test and run in the cloud pretty seamless. So what works for me works for you. Yeah. Yeah, one, one, one company handbook for how all software is run, regardless of what type of app it was. That's also very helpful. That idea, like you can train one person, they, they can move from team to team, and that the process is the same, the tools are the same. You built a cool tool for one, in one group, it's now usable across an entire you know, 4,000 person company. Mm. But tell me, why is that so difficult? What, what is the reason for that? What's difficult why, about why is part that of that's difficult for the handbook? No, 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 no. Why, why is that, you know, all of these environments, there's nobody's going to view that, you know, developers need to take the code, like he was saying, all the way to production. I mean, it's, it's not rocket science. But then we, we leave it, saying that, okay, once your code is ready, then just push it. Yeah. You know, so it's like, it's strange. Well, aren't we just taking, I mean, you know, PASS has some interesting, and, and cloud has introduced some, some new techniques, methodologies to developers, different ways to deal with applications, to offload this, to write applications a little differently, to consider, you know, where we're putting state and how we're architecting them, even. And then you bring things like APIs in, which are a big part of PASS as well, and that it changes the way they develop their applications. So it almost sounds like what you're saying, though, is that we basically have to recreate what they have now in a cloud and make it easy. And that's really just the difference, is that it should be easier. Well, everything should really always it? be yeah. easier. Always easier, always. <laughs> but, easier and, as but a there's service. a reason for that, yeah, right? Easier I mean, as a service. The easier yeah. the tools are to use, the, the less thinking has to go in sure. to discussing the tools, to working, you know, how much business process has to get wrapped up in the tool. Uh, how, many, how many times do we run our business in a way just because that's what the tool wants us to do? And uh, that means we can't evolve. And you know, what's the point of having a retro if every two weeks we go, yeah, the tool's shit, and we just have to keep using the tool the way you know, we'd like to change our process, but the tool won't let us. So part of you know, we need the reason for APIs and the reason for it being you know, the pads itself, and then the apps we build decomposable, so we can, you know, evolve around it, and the tool is there to serve us. And I, I feel like I've gone off on a tangent. <laughs> I don't know if you're watching, but I felt like they didn't answer the question. Yeah, yeah so let's, let's we can confirm that later. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead, Pradeep. No, I, I was just wondering if uh, the audience had any questions or thoughts. I wanted to jump in uh, to the discussion. Hey, we developers are here. Never hire a new young person. Always hire a, an older, more mature person. <laughs> Am I that mature? <laughs> At our age. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a good question. That's a good actually. question. That's a very and, good question. Yeah. And I think it was also earlier there was this question about, uh, you know, is all this abstraction really, you know, developing the talent pool? Because as we know, as an industry, we struggle with this talent pool, right? The demands are more and more of delivering more and more applications, you know, more and more devices, more and more technologies. And then how do we really enable these, uh, uh, the young developer talent to come in? And, and I think it, it all depends on the talent. I think if the talent is there, I think they will figure it out. You no, know, I, they'll figure out rocket science. I think but, this is the point. But the point of PAS is, is to make it easy for young people to come in. Right? I mean, yeah. you go through the stack, if you do web apps, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, uh, and you want to go through web apps, you look at what you've got to know, right? And this is before you even go into production. HTML, JavaScript, uh, CSS, even if you're not the skilled person, you don't know what the hell they're there for. The language of choice, the libraries that go with it, then there's the Unix operating system, assuming you're running on that, or whichever operating system is the random one that you've been told to use if it's not Unix. Um, <laughs> you know, there's so much to know. And it's you know, how, how many years you know, part of, I think, what we pride ourselves as a profession, that there isn't like a six-year 
mandatory process to go and become skilled and you know, get a stamp and say, yes, you are now allowed to go out and call yourself a software developer. Jonathan has a comment or a question. It'll make it interesting now. Yeah. Those developers that really need the deep architectural skills to essentially put the plumbing together and to yeah. do all the work we need to do to build out PaaS platforms and to enable them and to connect them to all the shit that we're running everywhere else, right? And then a new gen literally a new generation of developers that are actually much more business focused, right? That sit above that abstraction layer, yeah. that are really focused on leveraging the composable yeah. components, they're composed they're composing applications. And they don't need to know about any of the stuff underneath, but they, they've got the business skills to work with the business and to sort of very rapidly deliver value to the business. I, I think that's 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 what Jonathan that's just that's said. That's how, wait, how is that different from the, the differentiation between app developers and enterprise architects? I mean, I was an architect. Just, just he did all out. the plumbing. And the I developers might, just sat up here and coded business. I, I might have missed the, the definition level that level. you all got, but what's an enterprise architect? <laughs> I usually associate We do the plumbing. Yeah. Well, that's why yes. Force.com has We're a million fun. developers right now. See if you're like offended on it. And then there's people who wrote Power Builder and wrote Visual Basic. Right? That's what he's talking about. I think it's a completely legitimate way to nobody else. <laughs> Waterfall and offshore. Nice. There. That's, Covered. That's the white elephant sitting in the middle of this conversation. Offshore, you water. When you have a, a tremendously uh, factory line waterfall process where you offshore business requirements that were written by these people this month, they get sent to India for this. Is that what you think Jonathan just said? And enterprises do keep wanting to buy that, regardless of it, you know, various validities of certain things. No, but that, that's also one of the reasons for that is because you have different tools used by different specialists, right? Requirements right. is done differently. Uh, continuous integration is a different tool. Deployment is a different tool. I think the whole idea that it has to be one tool because it is one team. I think that's where it has to pass and developer services. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, Alex was asking me, if you do that, then you know, uh, isn't that going to be less specialized in one area and things like that? Of course, there are going to be applications and teams which will require specialized uh, testing tool or a specialized deployment tool. But I think 70 or 80 percent can be a single team on a single tool with a single dashboard looking at all of these, whether it's dev, whether it's ops, everybody. And I think that's, that's going to be a reality in the next yeah. uh, few years. Well, yeah, and like Alex was mentioning, one of the prime examples of this is, you know, you get pass and then you have like the new Node.js developer, um, which I still find funny because you don't really do that. You write JavaScript and it runs <laughs> on Node. But anyway, um, you, know, you have this situation where they have ripped out tons and tons and tons of abstractions, quite literally. You know, the, you get in data in through the client side in a browser, and you get it in a JSON format, and then you just deal directly with that. Whereas in a traditional .NET or Java enterprise app, you have entire development teams sitting around making, generating ORMs, and then figuring out how they're going to manipulate and make all that data concurrent. Whereas these developers that are writing Node.js apps are just pulling it right through and dealing with it in a synchronous way because it's become simple enough to do that with that tool set. You throw a pass on top of it, and then, like James mentioned, you could, you could run large development teams you know, in an offshore, onshore, yeah. whatever type of way, it, because you've ripped out half of the complexity. You can hire a lot of people that have a that's very right. focused skill set to do that. Well, that's that Alex's, like one really Alex's senior person. question, I think, yeah. before, of expectations. I mean, I interviewed a bunch of kids at UCLA last year, and what language are you writing? No one's writing Java and .NET when they're in university. They're writing Objective-C, they're writing JavaScript. So if yeah. I don't have an environment where they can come in as summer, and in, summer interns and bang out something cool, that's also going to be tough. So I mean, the yeah. expectation is the polyglot stuff is nice, where, you know what, write your .NET stuff, deploy that stuff for prod, but don't cut yourself off at the knees and eliminate a lot of other cool apps yeah. you could be building. Right. So what does that say about Simon Schiller's comment earlier about the state of the nation and the 
politics of IT in comparison to the Republican Democratic parties that we're seeing more objective C. Well, well, I think the that that area is undercutting itself to some degree. I mean, the whole <laughs> maybe I shouldn't go into this space, but like the whole <laughs> sharing economy is undercutting the big Republican Democrat fussy pants arguments that go on all the time. Bitcoin. Yeah, Bitcoin. There you go. They can't do anything about it. You know, that's the plain and simple of it. You've lost me on the American politic metaphor. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> we'll bring it up to speed later. So which, but, which is the party that's sending drones into the other countries? All of the, the above, foreigners? and that's Java. the problem. Right. Um, There's an airplane with a small child stuck on top. That's yes. imagine, <laughs> imagine you flew here in a Cessna 172. And yeah, now, watch out for the drones. And now I have to go to work. Yeah. <laughs> When's the revolution? Are we in the revolution right now? I think we're kind of in the midst of it. Yep. Well, it's, is, that, is that an actual question? Is that what we're looking for? Is that what big companies are looking for? Are they looking for a revolution? I don't know. What, I mean, it, it, what, I mean, what I you're really I mean, asking is, is past the mobile, I mean, the right? No. I mean, you've got it's, to take in, with inputs and outputs, right? So I mean, what's the role of communities in the revolution? So, I mean, he made a really interesting point, right? What's the, what's the yes. raw material that can come into a, a company? It's young people. Well, if they don't have the technology background that your company is still forcing on people, you're not going to get that raw material of young people yeah. who want to build stuff. It, whereas if you start to move your internal technology towards what is happening in the outside world, you get a lot more excited, available tech talent yeah. that can come to you. So choose a way. Um, if you, you know, I, the thing I like about this is the, you know, what Jonathan was talking about was this idea of letting the people, as the way I put it, is let the people with the problem write the, the program, which has a tremendous amount of alliteration, yep, which yeah. I hadn't really thought about, which I'm really quite impressed with. Um, <laughs> Trademark <laughs> pending. <laughs> so, uh, you know, part of it is the standard thing. If you can bring in um, talent that has domain knowledge, but doesn't necessarily have to have do we have enough enterprise architects to go around? No, we don't. Sorry, can't do your project. Um, you know, if we can let, you know, the thing I love about Excel is that you don't need to ask permission to solve your problem with it. And uh, yeah, PaaS is more complex and writing a Ruby app or a Java app or a Node app is more complex than doing an Excel spreadsheet. But it's that, it's that idea of can I solve my problem with, with the skills that I have, at least get the job mm -hmm. done. Um, and the other part I kind of liked was, I think James said the idea of, of uh, mission critical apps, or he said the big apps, I can't remember the word now, but the idea that there are a certain set of apps which are important apps, that might be the word. And if there's one revolution, it might be the, the revolution of you don't know which is important. <laughs> the importance happens and it's like shit, the important app is the one written by the biz guy in Node in his spare time, <laughs> and we yep. have no idea where it's running, how it's running, or how to help it succeed, but it's just gone down. Case in point, I work for a substantially large financial company that I won't state. Um, and How many jobs do you have? Many. Um, <laughs> so I was working there and there's portfolio managers and account managers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and they have all these different apps. A lot of them are in Excel. One of the reasons, lower barrier to entry, they got to get something done then, they go pull it up in Excel. If it's a little more complicated than that, they go to the immediate dev wherever they're at. Um, and they have a lot of apps that way. And then of course there's the official IT funnel, which is massive. And to note, the way to get a new instance was a 13-page paper document to fill out, and this was only like two years ago. <laughs> Needless to say, they had this many filled out. But they had a lot of new instances running at this little thing called AWS. And when they decided that they didn't want all this weird traffic going in and out of the network, they cut it off and they realized that they had several production financial apps, that portfolio managers and other managers in the entity used that they had to have. And the reason they were there was because the developers that were responsible for getting this done and wanted to do a good job had just ignored the bureaucracy and got the job done. Sure. And that's, that, that's the revolution. Yeah, yeah. and that, that goes back to so Maybe I'm not that. running the server on my desktop anymore where I was running an app everyone was using at the company for two years on a stupid desktop because right. it took eight weeks to get a server. Maybe yeah. you stop having a little more of that instead have a consolidated internal external paths and yep. make it easier. I see a question there. Yep. Yeah. Well, maybe ERP is a service, so I don't know if we're rewriting an ERP in PaaS, well, so but... I don't know, I have weird opinions about ERP. In a joint with that, so one of the things that I see happening in PaaS, and you guys can shoot this down if you see it as being different, but is the granularization of what we're building. 
So we're not building big, giant, honking ERP-like systems with right. massive modules and 500 tabs that you have to know how to click to get the right thing. We're building a whole bunch of small things that are then chained together. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in an almost um, uh, evolutionary way, you know, into processes just by the way they get formed. It's so almost like the apps. The yeah. apps around, like it's almost like force.com, where you have you can build those apps around it. Well, no, right. It is, which is which goes back to what well, pass, you know, an expect, my, one of my experiences in the past that helps me run not yeah. only each application but the portfolio of that. Mm -hmm. You've validated right. that maybe I'm not crazy about ERP, but whenever one single entity tries to build a massive monolithic something, like. You know, you build this thing, you think it all through, and then like your cert server messes up and your whole system's turned off. Um, you know, it seems like those systems are the ones that don't work well. Whereas things that we don't try to completely dominate in some way work exceptionally well, like the internet, for instance. And whenever I see ERP stuff, it, it always seems like it's a use case for the Mythic Man Month and all of these types of situations that have many, many books written about them where you try to implement it and it never, ever, ever truly actually gets done. Whereas you tackle these smaller problems and you get tons of stuff done. And even if you don't get to the, the mythic future roadmap thing, you still have tons of enablement and you're much more agile. You're able to shift to business need. And it just, it just works so much better. And it's so See, much the more big, reliable. The biggest, the, sort of the ugly reality of the enterprise kicks in, right? Right, right. right. There's yeah. A, there's a reason why billions of dollars worth of software, right? Because the software solves the problem. Right. It's a piece of shit, but it solves a business problem. Right? Yep. And, and it makes people feel very comfortable. So you have to have governance processes around it, because you, you're going to have to accommodate the fact that you've got an SAP ERP system. And what you want to do is put it in a little box, keep it as narrowly focused as possible, mm -hmm. put an interface around it, and build all the other value you're going to deliver in this new smart way right. in a pass based environment. But you're sure. never going to get rid of it. Nobody's going to go write a GL or, a, or an accounts receivable system. You'd just be mad to do that. You just yeah. need the controls <laughs> around. Sorry. No, that someone's doing that. that. You, would never put the, you would never allow that thing to become the hub of your architecture. You put it as an endpoint, right? You stick it in a corner. You keep it nice in a box. You don't let anybody customize it. And anything you want to customize, you build it outside in a nice, flexible, you know, very fast time to market type environment. As close but to but that what, ideal what, as possible, yes. But what you have today, ERP is nothing but software just hosted and offered in the cloud. It's not right. composable services. No, no, yeah, it's so not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's right. Did you feel that someone said that they couldn't? Is that I missed? Is there a segue that I missed? I don't like. Did we say that? Sure. I think verticalization of pass is going to be the future. At some point, there are going to be verticalized passes, whether it is around CRM or around e-commerce, and it just makes it easy for you to build those particular, particular functionality, calling those services, and, and having apps around that. So vertical yeah. passes are going to emerge. SAP, and, yeah. SAP should come with a pass. Yeah. <laughs> Slow cap. Right. Good. Pick a thing, and it should come with a pass. I mean, <laughs> Why, why does Facebook not have a pass that my app runs right next to their data center? Well, Oracle is claiming they have one now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're talking about. Yeah. But I think this goes to the componentization thing, too, right? And the importance of APIs mm -hmm. in this whole story. Yeah. One of the things yeah. that Cloud Foundry, I think, did really, really well early on was they is they clearly defined on that triangle that they used on day one of the launch mm -hmm. that services were a primary member of the fold and that you could turn anything that had an API that was communicatable 
um, into a service if you wrapped it the correct way and made it available. And I think for any other paths, that's more or less the same story. It may, may be more or less a formal construct. And you still got to solve the messaging problem, the identity integration, the integration. I mean, that stuff doesn't go away just right. because I have 500 apps in pass. Right. If I can't do single sign-on, I can't use it with my enterprise stuff. Class Foundry so, has the yeah. single sign-on. UAA, there we go. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. but the, uh, but I think Works, too. It's kind of handy. The critical point is if you begin to treat the enterprise architecture as a bunch of components, some of which are very large grain, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, or fortunately, some of which are more and more of which are very, very small grain and do very small things very well. You may be able to have some duplicitous uh, functionality out there where you know one business unit built it one way, one business unit built it another way. But ultimately, that's the that's the flexibility that allows a developer to go. I've got a problem in my space. These are the interfaces I can see easily available to me to go after solving the problem. I can ask right. the community if there's anything else I can use to help me solve the problem, and from there, put together a solution and, or find a solution to my problem quickly. Yep. If we have to say, you know, you know, you've got to get on the schedule to hire a set of, of, uh, of our, you know, our system integrators to go out and build the custom interface that you need on the platform mm -hmm. that we choose, that's the broken piece of it that I think, so, so we encapsulate. I think that's exactly right. Whether you use it as a SaaS yeah. or you use it as a sure. product on, on site, it doesn't matter, as long as I can encapsulate it. And restrict its use to yeah, I mean, it's, it's, perhaps it's part of this conversation, perhaps it's not, but I think it's super important to take all the legacy data that an organization, perhaps it's a critical asset, right? Mm -hmm. And make it into these interfaces that, you know, become what Jonathan's referring to, you know, build to all these little apps. It's still the SOA yeah. on steroids, as you alluded to, I mean, yeah. times with the past. <laughs> nothing, nothing harder yeah. to get to than someone else's Excel spreadsheet, which is running their department. Yeah. Um, right. I, I would say, too, um, Speaking of developer expectations. You're still their laptop when they're not looking. Yeah. He's it, pulling it in. Laptop theft, dangerous <laughs> thing. But it, and John, you know, as far as developer expectations go, a lot of developers don't ever want to even hear ERP or a lot of that stuff. That's I mean, you hire very specific people that are very focused on that thing. Um, so as far as developer expectations, I don't think there is much as far as ERP and those things. I don't think a lot of developers actually care. It's just the big box. Yeah, they're you like, it's the big box. Anymore. Put it over there. I don't want to touch it because if it breaks, all the very, very important people will scream at me or I will get fired. Or so. I was just told I need to send the financial data yeah. once a day to this end point. Yeah. Okay, I've done that. You it's know. that one piece of XML data that you like had nightmares about, yeah, so. You don't care about it, right? I'm just like, it's not the, Exactly. <laughs> So Otherwise, you totally of me, ignore it. I've got to be honest. There's a part of me that understands this modularity of people with single purposes, the Adam Smith principle applied to corporate <laughs> IT, but there's the CI, CTO part of me that goes, oh, I need to know how it all works. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking me out. So let's walk the chain. But that's a, the visualization piece. Is, is, sorry. Right, just to go, can we go back to the conversation a bit? Yeah. So we have this beautiful world in which we're going to see a set of developers are going to build the paths, they're going to know all the grunty details and how this stuff works. And we're going to have a bunch of developers who are more domain specific and they get to live in this beautiful rainbow and unicorn world. Right. The bifurcated world. What happens when it doesn't work? What are you talking about? <laughs> what? There's no unicorns, no rainbows? Who finds the bottom? Who's responsible for finding out that? So this spot right here where you kind of copy things way more than it should be? That's, that's why it runs three times slower than anybody thinks. I mean, Who's going to find that spot? Well, that's why AWS runs at 20%. It's, a, it's that extra ump, right? I mean, then you can just... Wait, they're going to remove the sleep statements later? Yeah, exactly. I, I, but I think that's just one aspect of running a production system, which is the, you know, the, what I think is the challenge most engineers have, which is the sad point of, like, they wrote this beautiful code, and uh, the great thing about Agile is we force it into production two weeks later. Uh, the downside of perhaps older IT is you get, to, you get to write code outside of production for months, years before anyone touches it. You've moved on to another job. You might go through a lifetime and never see your code have to live with a production system. Um, so I think you know, we need to bring those tools to people to answer questions like that. You need to know that this is slow, this is unacceptable, you know, you know, one second response times are unacceptable just because the rest of your team thought they're okay. You know, as an organization, we're not going to tolerate it. Please go and fix it. You know, reprioritize production rather than just features. Do they need tools or do they need visibility deeper into the actual stack of what's going on? So, okay, I mean, so you, one of the adding tools can be So one of the, one of the things often not represented in a team meeting is the customer or the pain points of the customer. You might have the, the, the product manager or the, you know, the scrum master, and he might, they might be saying, right, we've got features to build. 
Let's build features. Oh, first fix the bugs, whatever. Then we're on to features and s velocity and sprints and yes. And uh, future. And, and I, what, what I like about tools is hopefully is it brings production, like it becomes a, a person at the meeting saying, I am production, I am sick, please prioritize me. Um, because you've still got those same people. They're in part of this brave new world with unicorns and rainbows, they are the same people going to be fixing production as much as they can because we've said this is your part of production. So, so in the new world, there's an expectation that a developer is like a full stack developer, can do well, the I mean, front end, can do the middle, no, 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 can yes, do the back end. Yes and no, because yep. we're talking They're about the bifurcated ownership. world where we have, the, we have a person, almost like the guru, um, that knows the full stack, that knows everything that's going on, but there's also the expectation of, per se, the enterprise, mm -hmm. that they can hire tons and tons and tons of people that just know how to do this app thing. And then that's the danger of separating that. <laughs> well, I mean, that's what it, it becomes. It becomes this kind of dumbed down yep. process, right? Yep. Yeah, so you know, when we write the app thing. <laughs> well, we um, call them apps. If you do mobile that. development, you call it just back end stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so an app got taken away and used for the thing that runs on the phone. So yeah. interesting vocabulary change that also happened. Mm -hmm. So with that vocabulary change, you know, you have the separation of these two groups of people. And you've got to keep that balanced. Otherwise, you yeah, run the risk yeah. of doing exactly what but with he smaller, pointed out. But with smaller teams, they're doing both the front end, the back end, the ops side, everything. Well, yeah, I mean, they're small teams. And, you know, yeah, they smaller do teams, startups have to do, they have to everything. do everything. It's yeah. not an option. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but in enterprises, there are all those things they have yeah. to hook into and all of those endpoints. So Wait, you get the guys who can do the that's, apps, who's going to do the That is not necessarily what stuff. enterprise is. Like, I mean, we go back to the idea of the people at the fringes of the business being able to solve their own problems. They don't come with a 20-person IT team. Part of what we're trying to let them do is yeah. to solve their own problem. So enterprises can have an innovation team or a small you know, internet business team, if whatever it is, and they're going yeah. to do all of this. They're going to work just like a startup. They're going to use all the paths, all of this. So I'm sorry, what I'm hearing is that like traditional, you know, like the enterprise, I lived in the Midwest, so I worked for what we call enterprise. Oh, I see. Yeah. The Big IT, right? They're the ones that win the election. This. <laughs> The pass that. is just, that would be crazy. It'd be great for the front end stuff, but you still have all of this legacy stuff. It's gotta be talked to, it's gotta be, you know, and you're coming out of school and these guys are like, what, COBOL? Yeah. Right? I mean, is well, that what we're headed to with that bifurcation where we're gonna have that, we're gonna continue to have that where we've got legacy silos inside well, and this, these teams don't come to fruition? To a large part, because a lot of people that come out of school, you know, they're looking at Ruby on Rails, JavaScript, all this yeah. new stuff that they hear about. I mean, it's all over the internet. And then they go walk into an enterprise, especially if they're, you know, not out here in, you know, Silicon Valley land or something. Midwest. You know, they walk into the Midwest <laughs> enterprise and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I don't know any of this technology. Exactly. I have to learn it. Yeah. This so. is Windows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> My this dad is told me about that. With this. Yeah. Wow. Four and spaces. The dragging yeah. and the dropping of stuff. This is. <laughs> so dad, that's, this is terrible. I think a model to, that I, I look at as really interesting in the space is is, um, is what Bechtel's been doing with with putting an API layer over the back end systems <laughs> in the data environment, and then mm -hmm. allowing young sharp developers in the valley, but it could be anywhere. Uh, come in and write, and write new applications that, that consume that data, and even if they generate new data, you know, providing services to help them store and retrieve that data. Um, and, and the idea being that you know, the, you know, the separation of concerns isn't something where it's a it's an interdepartmental contract, right? The separation of concerns is largely about the way that. Things are, are made available and presented on a self surface way to the teams that need that information and need that stuff. Right. Sounds um, very much like paths to me, right, with services that are available through it. It can be done a bunch of different ways. It doesn't have to be done by paths. But I think that that's a model, actually. And that's a company that, you know, they have, they have, they have a presence in the Silicon Valley, but they're all over the place. And I, it's also something I'm beginning to hear in other places where we're sort of saying, well, you know, I don't want it. You know, I, I want the ability to, to be able to generate new applications quickly and have people experiment and try things and fail cheaply and all those other things on the front end. And so I need to begin to look at ways of presenting these core systems like SAP, like, uh, you know, other systems in a way that's even consumable. Maybe that's a good PaaS use case of my previous job as a enterprise architect. Sorry for... Uh, 
an R&D company, a biotech company. <laughs> There's one. They wanted to, I mean, I was pushing to say, let's API enable the stupid Siebel app that no one ever can dip into it. But the problem was there was never that motivation to say, let's go invest. Let's do it in the course of a project then. There wasn't and then, just that effort to API enable big that. stuff. Now you get an API that's sort of, well, it's optimized for that use case. And, and meanwhile, though, you're going to get that request and say, hey, can we make this clinical trial system mobile in six weeks? Impossible because there's no freaking APIs on anything. So you only yeah. need it after the fact versus saying, let's take right. a dedicated effort a little stupid team that runs around, puts them all in a well, pass, and gives me enterprise perhaps services. That's the CIO, CTO's job of, of big enterprise for the next five years is, sure. is to say, you know, we, we don't know what we need. The world is changing too fast. Mm -hmm. So let's yeah. do the right thing and let's, you know, APFI all our data. Yeah, the living hell out of every system. And, and what's interesting about yeah. the, you know, the, that, because that's even the way I say that is the data we've already got. But part of the next five years of your business is you're going to collect a bunch of data you don't even have thought about existing as your universe. That's what's hidden in all those Excel spreadsheets, yeah. is data that someone could put together in a schema of their own choice. And you know, that, I don't know the solution, but it's really you, interesting. You know, this is, a, this is, like, this is an example of the marketplace where we're seeing the, where those that are developing self-service apps and those who are not there, is that an example of that position No, I think uh, if it's going to be self-service web apps, then of course the, all of these come into play. I think nobody's going to build today without those things. I mean, uh, yeah. using a pass, using composable services, all of that comes into play. With backend, this is the big issue. Right? Yeah. Most of the data, especially in large enterprises, is in the backend and the ERP quest and all of that. And and that data and that those services are so valuable, even for the front end. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we bridge that? And, and, and I think that's where the real question will be, is how can developers really use that when it's all legacy, a lot of old stuff, even three years old is legacy, right? Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's gonna be a very, very difficult question to uh, tackle, unless those vendors, the big vendors, come on, to, come on, come on with uh, come, you know, open services around that. But you're not gonna bet on that. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on that, but the API yeah. layer, really, I mean, because that's, yeah. I mean, pass, I mean, integrating with those services in a pass, you're using an API. When you manage it, you're using an API. When you Absolutely. bring in the test harness, you're using an API. They have to do that in the enterprise because otherwise there are those, you're not going to get any talent. Eventually, they're not even going to want to learn right. the legacy stuff. Right now, they might because that's what their option is, but eventually it's going to... Young people are very malleable. No, uh, well, to break yeah, their spirit awesome. pretty soon. They know what they want. I think there's a question, a question or comment there. Yeah. Um, so I recommend that getting started building APIs first, because the first generation of APIs will be complete shit, and you want to throw it <laughs> Oh, yeah. Efficient and have all the wrong models, and you have Version to wrong. your APIs. Mm -hmm. we've, we've been doing that with basically, that's what Netflix did. We built APIs to all of our stuff in the data center as we were getting out into the cloud and in between all the different systems. But it's a very important chicken and egg problem. You have to sort of start it, get some users for the APIs, and sure. then find out what, where should the. <laughs> but this was all your stuff, right? You 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 could you had control over those stuff, so you could open it up. And... So indeed, you, you well, we, the, have, we have to wrap up, Nick. We really do. It's, okay. I think we're late. I know. It's sad. Well, you're you're entertaining. Start talking. So you come, <laughs> come to the hackathon. <laughs> <hand thought, laughs> yeah, you can I've continue. I've got a small plane going, continue. catch. I, you know. Continue outside. Who I think doesn't? maybe the I answer to the question. developer expectations for right now is APIs. Whether I think he just said in the, the cloud, inside, I mean, and building that iterative process. I think APIs are really critical to pass no matter where they are. So, yeah. all right, <laughs> this has been great conversation, great questions. Um, so thank you all, and I, I hope it's been uh, worth, worth your time this afternoon. Thank you guys for Thanks, being Mike. up here. Thank you. It's been great. Uh -huh.